We know a lot of you value the CyberWire and that it helps you do your jobs better. And we hope you'll check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash the CyberWire and become a regular supporter. Thanks. A reporter who covered the Panama Papers is assassinated in Malta. Black Oasis is found distributing Finn Fisher by exploitation of a bug in Flash Player. North Korea hacking is said to have been responsible for cancellation of a projected television show. Infineon patches a firmware flaw that could be exploited in a coppersmith's attack. Vendors work to close the crack in their Wi-Fi products. WikiLeaks appears to be preparing for a large dump. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security mandates improved email and website security across the federal government. And the U.S. Supreme Court will review a significant cloud data decision. Time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Recorded Future. If you haven't already done so, take a look at Recorded Future's Cyber Daily. We look at it. The CyberWire staff subscribes and consults it daily. The web is rich with indicators and warnings, but it's nearly impossible to collect them by eyeballing the internet yourself, no matter how many analysts you might have on staff. And we're betting that however many you have, you haven't got enough. Recorded Future does the hard work for you by automatically collecting and organizing the entire web to identify new vulnerabilities and emerging threat indicators. Sign up for the Cyber Daily email to get the top trending technical indicators crossing the web. Cyber news, targeted industries, threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, malware, and suspicious IP addresses. Subscribe today and stay ahead of the cyber attacks. Go to recordedfuture.com slash intel to subscribe for free threat intelligence updates from Recorded Future. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. I'm Dave Bittner in Baltimore with your CyberWire summary for Tuesday, October 17, 2017. One of the reporters who had been most active in pursuing leads into corruption and money laundering surfaced by the Panama Papers was killed yesterday in a car bombing. Daphne Caruana Galizia, a journalist working in Malta, who had been called a one-woman WikiLeaks, died when a powerful bomb destroyed her car Monday afternoon. No one has claimed responsibility. Galizia's reporting had for the past two years focused largely on chasing down stories suggested in the Panama Papers, as leaks from the Masak Fonseco law firm have come to be called. Her post to her running commentary blog had made enemies in both of Malta's principal political parties, the ruling Labour Party and the opposition nationalists. She had also earned the enmity of organized crime. Galizia had filed a police report two weeks ago concerning death threats she had received. Investigation of the murder is in its early stages. Major political parties have condemned the killing and called for calm. Yesterday, Adobe patched a Flash Player Zero Day, CVE 2017-11292, that Kaspersky Lab discovered being exploited in the wild. The exploitation, attributed to the little-known and less-understood threat actor Black Oasis, was installing FinFisher spyware into selected targets. FinFisher is famous as the lawful intercept tool that's been controversially used by governments around the world. Black Oasis is thought to be a threat actor operating from somewhere within the Middle East. They have tended to select their targets from Russia, Iraq, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Libya, Jordan, Tunisia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, the Netherlands, Bahrain, the United Kingdom, and Angola. Microsoft tracks Black Oasis under the name Neodymium, they tracked the threat actor last year, also using a Flash Player exploit to distribute FinFisher. The targets then were, for the most part, located in Turkey. Black Oasis exhibits a broad range of interests, but they tend to center on Middle Eastern politics, including UN operations, opposition figures and activists, regional news reporters, and of course the oil industry, which would seem a possible explanation for some of the out-of-area targeting. It's been revealed that a 2014 North Korean cyber attack against British production company Mammoth Screen prompted cancellation of a projected television series. The show, Opposite Number, had a plot revolving around the imprisonment of a British nuclear scientist in the DPRK. This is the second major known hack of a media company related to Pyongyang's objections to media content. The other case, of course, is the Sony hack. 
A firmware patch from Infineon closes a vulnerability that could be exploited to reveal private encryption keys in a fast prime attack. A proof of concept uses a variant of the Coppersmith's attack, ROCA for return of Coppersmith's attack. Coppersmith's attack is an old one, and users of devices with Infineon chips are advised to apply the firmware patch as soon as possible. Much advice is being offered on protection from the crack Wi-Fi vulnerability. Several vendors have issued patches to deal with it, but it's likely to persist for a long time, especially in the Internet of Things. In the meantime, here are the companies that either have or are expected to soon have a fix for crack attacks, as reported by ZDNet. Aruba has issued a security advisory as well as patches for its software. Microsoft's Windows products are thought to be relatively little affected, but the company has pushed fixes out through its automatic updating. Linux has made a patch available. Intel has also patched. Netgear, Microchip, MicroTIC, OpenBSD, Ubiquity Networks, HostAP, and WatchGuard have all issued fixes. Apple expects to update iOS, macOS, watchOS, and tvOS within a few weeks. Cisco is looking into the vulnerability, has some fixes out, and is working on others. Aris and AVM are evaluating the situation. Google is in the same boat, investigating with patches to come as they're developed. Fortinet is working on a fix. Express If Systems has begun patching its chipsets. FreeBSD is working on patching its base system. Wi-Fi Standard has made a fix available to vendors. And finally, the Wi-Fi Alliance is offering a crack detection tool to its members. It's also requiring new members to test for the vulnerability. WikiLeaks's Julian Assange has tweeted out some odd code that looks like the insurance code released in advance of past major leaks. Nothing is broken yet, but people have their eyes and ears open. Yesterday, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security issued Binding Operational Directive 18-01. This will require U.S. federal agencies to adopt DMARC security standards to improve email security. The directive also recommends using HTTP Strict Transport Security, HSTS, to ensure HTTPS connections and remove a user's ability to click through certificate warning. There are those who say when it comes to suffering a data breach, it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. Whether or not you subscribe to that philosophy, it's prudent to plan for the worst and have a resiliency plan in place, a way to ensure that while you're recovering from whatever may have happened, your business stays up and running. Neil Murray is Chief Technology Officer at Mimecast, and he offers his thoughts on cyber resilience. In summary, it's protecting users, data, and operations from uh, risks that may arise due to human error, malicious intent, or technological failure. Uh, so it's not, it's not all about just a defensive barrier that you, know, you may think about when you think of cybersecurity. There are issues related to things like ransomware, for example, where you might need to recover data, and that's not a defensive technology. That's a technology of recovery. And there are often needs to interact with uh, the systems that are affected whilst an incident is ongoing. So you have to keep the business running. That's really the summary of, of cyber resilience. How do you deal with all this stuff and keep the business running? There are uh, additionally uh, human awareness uh, requirements. So the human firewall is important as part of the uh, cyber resiliency process. And that is that technology can do a certain amount, but Human beings are the weakest link, so you want to make sure that they're also made resilient through awareness. Yeah, what about the, the emotional component of all this? You know, when something bad happens, people get upset, and, and I think that's an, an underestimated uh, part of the equation for many organizations. Sure, and there, and there is, and, and you, you would have seen in the Equifax uh, incident recently that a lot of the damage gets done when the reaction is not prepared and planned. Obviously, there's the preparation, and you know, if, if companies are found wanting when it comes to preparation, that's one thing. But you do need effective communications during these kinds of incidents, and that does take preparation and planning. You also need to spend a lot of time with your staff, trying to educate them about how these things come about, what may happen in those circumstances. They should feel confident that you, you have done the right things. But uh, it gets emotional when it's not done right, I think is the summary. You know, I remember when I was a kid, of course, we all probably experienced having fire drills to practice what would happen if in the event that there was a fire. Do companies need to go through a similar thing when planning out their cyber resilience? 
Well, there are there are great technologies out there to, that do drills like this. There's pluses and minuses to them. Fire drills is one way, which is a periodic you know process of testing your people. The downsides are that uh, people who get caught out feel like they were caught out. You know, so there's a negative that can come from that. Uh, oh, you tricked me. Um, I mean, that's obviously the point of it, but but some of these tests can be can be pretty negative. Hmm. Uh, that's not to say you mustn't do them. It's just that you have to deal with the fallout that comes from that. Uh, one of the approaches we take is is real time awareness, which means that as people are clicking on links inside their emails or you know downloading attachments from emails, we may take a moment on a randomized or a periodic basis to provide a teaching moment to them. In other words, ask them a question about where they think they're going and ask them whether they think that site is safe or not. And then we'll tell them whether it is or not, but we want them to make a call on it. And that raises the awareness in, in a more or less real-time fashion. So that's, that's more real-time. Fire drills much more periodic. So what would be your advice for someone who's trying to uh, address this, someone who's trying to get organized and have a proper plan when it comes to resilience? I think there are quite a few good resources online about uh, cyber resilience. It's a, it's an emerging term for sure in that we're talking about not just cyber security, the defensive part of it, but something that's a bit more comprehensive. There's obviously a technological component. You need to go and source vendors, uh, make sure that they have a broader offering than just a defensive portion to their technology. So you, you really do need recovery options, continuity options. Those are the kinds of things that are as critical as the defensive piece. That's Neil Murray from Mindcast. The U.S. Supreme Court has agreed to hear an appeal of a Second Circuit decision that exempted data stored abroad from U.S. search warrants. The Second Circuit's decision in favor of Microsoft found that emails were beyond the reach of U.S. domestic search warrants when the user whose emails were sought signed up for Microsoft service while he was in Ireland. The ruling affected warrants issued under the Stored Communications Act of 1986, a law that's widely regarded as ripe for revision. The decision the U.S. Justice Department is appealing was widely regarded as a victory for privacy advocates and the tech companies who offer geographically dispersed cloud services. Law enforcement saw the ruling as a loss, depriving them of access to data needed to investigate crimes, ranging from child exploitation to murder. In the appeal, the two sides are basically represented by the tech industry, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, CNN, and Verizon, to take the most prominent companies, with an assist from the ACLU and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And in the other corner, the Justice Department, with backing from 33 U.S. states and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. The Supreme Court's decision will have far-reaching implications. A quick note from our sponsors at EH Security. They understand the difference between a buzzword and a real solution, and they can help you disentangle them too, especially when it comes to machine learning and artificial intelligence. You can get a free white paper that explains these new but proven technologies at ehsecurity.com slash cyberwire. We all know that human talent is as necessary to good security as it is scarce and expensive. But machine learning and artificial intelligence can help your human analysts scale to meet the challenges of today's and tomorrow's threats. They'll help you understand your choices, too. Did you know that while we might assume supervised machine learning, where the human teaches the machine, might seem to be the best approach, in fact, unsupervised machine learning can show the human something unexpected. Cut through the glare of information overload and move from data to understanding. Check out e8security.com slash cyberwire and find out more. And we thank E8 for sponsoring our show. Joining me once again is David DeFore. He's the Senior Director of Engineering and Cybersecurity at WebRoot. David, welcome back. Um, We wanted to talk today about some vulnerabilities when it comes to Bluetooth. Well, hi, David. Uh, Thanks for having me back. Um, Yeah, Bluetooth is making a lot of of noise here. Um, A little tidbit about me, I've not going to do this anymore, but I've been spending the last couple of months um, on Sunday morning sitting uh, at a restaurant, eat my oatmeal with my Bluetooth scanner 
out there looking for people with their Bluetooth uh, devices with their Bluetooth turned on. Hmm. Um, and it's, it, yeah. And then this news dropped. So uh, it's been advised to me. I probably want to stop doing that. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the trick here is, um, you know, your Bluetooth, it's a radio, just like a Wi-Fi device. And a lot of people don't think that it's capable of doing um, two way communication. They think it's a lot more secure than it is. But, you know, as your listeners know, anything that's software or hardware can be hacked. And there's exploits uh, that abound, uh, Blueborn being one of them, in terms of being able to take advantage of the actual Bluetooth standard and how it's been implemented in many devices. There's actually the capability through Bluetooth, um, even if it's connected to some other device, that you could um, get into a user's device by simply pulling that solution. Um, first off, you're going to scan for the radio to see if it's on. Then you're going to ping that device to try to make a determination of what the operating system is, potentially the version, maybe even the hardware of that. And then from there, uh, a, ne a nefarious actor could go out and look for exploits on that device. To be fair, you do have to be within a, um, a pretty tight range. Bluetooth doesn't have the range of other radio technologies. And it is, it is complicated. But it's becoming more prevalent as people uh, figure out you can do it. One of the only things you can do to protect yourself is to make sure that uh, you turn Bluetooth off if you're not using it. Now, what about if I am using Bluetooth? Let's say I'm in my car and I'm using the Bluetooth connection. Uh, if I'm connected between my phone and my vehicle, am I still vulnerable to someone else, you know, a drive-by attack? Well, so if you're if you're in your car, unless they're in the trunk um, and you don't realize it, <laughs> um, they're probably not going to be within range to be able to get between there. But, but you do ask a great question because if I'm sitting at, at a table and the person behind me is using uh, their phone to listen to Bluetooth potentially on headphones, it is possible and it's, it's very clear how to do this with Blueborn, it's possible to actually um, get access to that device and exploit it even if it's connected to a different device. This isn't a situation where it has to be in pairing um, looking for other devices. So a lot of people think that, that it has to be in that state, but no, the, the actual flaws are with the Bluetooth implementation um, that lets you get in if that radio is on and if it's connected to something else. So is this a hardware problem or is it software that can be patched? It's, it's definitely software that can be patched provided you're running the Bluetooth radio on a device that's updatable and that your vendor um, provides a patch for it. David DeFore, thanks for joining us. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors who make the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can help protect you using artificial intelligence, check out Silence.com. If you find this podcast valuable, we hope you'll consider becoming a contributor. You can go to patreon.com slash the CyberWire to find out how. The CyberWire podcast is produced by Pratt Street Media. Our editor is John Petrick. Social media editor is Jennifer Iben. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.